Hello, everybody. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. And welcome to uh, this uh, session, Civil Engineering and Renewable Energy 4. So we have four speakers uh, over the next hour. Uh, you should know the format by now. Each one has a 15 minute block um, and they hopefully will allow time for questions within that. And um, so I'll welcome our first speaker, uh, Associate Professor Johan Ronby. Uh, to turn on your camera, Johan, and you can start sharing your screen. Yeah, hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you perfectly. Um, so uh, everybody get your questions into the to the Q&A. Um, you're running out of chances to, to get points for the gamification as well. So let's spark some good discussion. So you can go ahead, uh, Johan, whenever you're ready. Yeah. Can you see my screen? Yep. Great. Okay, so thank you for the introduction, uh, Philip. So uh, yeah, today I will talk about basically the latest developments in uh, the, the isoad vector geometric WAF method. Um, the work I will present is uh, done in collaboration with Henning Scheufler from DLR in Germany, my research group at Olbo University, uh, Konstantinos Mischus, uh, Kaspar Müller and Finn Ashmanite. And then from Nils, uh, with Nils, Nils Gull Jakobsen from, from Deltaris. So I want to start just by recapping very briefly exactly what uh, isoad vector is. It's basically a new geometric volume of fluid approach that we implemented in open foam back in 2016. So a uh, geometric WAF method consists of an interface reconstruction step where the uh, exact location of the interface is approximated from the volume fraction field. Um, and this is done uh, by in isovector. Vector, so this is done by basically taking um, um, isosurfaces, making isosurfaces of the, of the interface, um, much like what Paraview does um, when you visualize an interface in, um, <clears throat> yeah, in Paraview, a, a fluid interface. Um, the interface advection step where we basically flux uh, heavy and light fluid or the two uh, fluids we have uh, in our simulation through the phases of the mesh. That's done in a particular way where we try to model the, um, what I call the, uh, the phase uh, interface intersection line. So basically now my simulation stopped here, but basically the line, um, the, the line uh, that you see here, um, the line here uh, passing through a, a phase, um, modeling how that evolves during a, a time step and using that information to, to uh, estimate the, the amount of water or whatever the heavy fluid is that's passed through a, a, a phase uh, during a time step. So this way of doing a geometric WAF is, has turned out to be very efficient and accurate uh, and with efficient, I mean efficient compared to um, sort of what we could call classical geometric WAF because we avoid the, the very expensive um, geometric uh, uh, intersection operations between polyhedral that we have in, in, in these uh, sort of the traditional way of doing geometrical WAF. Um, a very important feature of Isodex is that it works on unstructured meshes uh, with the sort of, you could say, uh, ugly polyhedral cells like the one I, I have shown uh, sh I show here, um, and that of obviously makes it applicable to to um, yeah, engineering uh, various kinds of, of, of engineering applications in uh, uh, where where this kind of thing is, is needed. Um, so it's released in the official open uh, foam version, the open CFD version from 1706, uh, version 1706, where Isovector is used by the so-called inter-isofoam solver, um, and you can in the, at the bottom here I show you the the path to the to the places in the in the open foam library that you can dive into if if you want to look into more details about the implementation, and finally the conceptual details you can you can find in in this paper from two thousand and and sixty yeah, sixteen sorry. Just can you see my cursor when I point here? Yes. Perfect. Okay. So just to show you uh, very quick, um, uh, this one one of the advantages of, of uh, Isoad Vector is it's improved um, 
shape uh, conservation. So if you just have a circular disk in a constant velocity field uh, shown by the velocity vector here, then this circle should just keep its shape as it moves upwards. But if you use the existing uh, advection method in open foam mules, then we can see that it actually distorts the interface here. And this does not seem to improve when we um, increase the resolution of our, of our simulation here. Um, this is one of the advantages of ISO vector. We get really good shape preservation. This, these panels are basically showing the final position up here uh, where, where we more or less have a perfect uh, circular circle, uh, circular circle, yeah, um, at the end of the advection here. So what's new in ISO vector since, uh, uh, since one year ago? Basically, um, we have been implementing a new porous inter-isofoam solver where inter-isofoam inter has been extended to, um, to cope with porous zones. Um, so when we have a porous zone, um, for instance, the, the blue area here, then uh, if, yeah, if the cells are partially filled with a porous material, then obviously there's less space for the fluid uh, flow. Um, and that in turn means that the uh, interface will move faster through the the porous zone. Uh, and when we try to repeat our simple pure advection case here with a, a porosity of 0 0.5 in this uh, blue region, then we see as expected that the increased velocity inside the porous zone uh, distorts the, the, the circular blob, but um, it really almost perfectly retains its circular shape as it comes out on the other side here. Um, in terms of volume conservation, we're basically down to machine um, precision. Um, for, for this case, this shows the error as a function of time. This shows uh, down here, we have the upper and lower bounding uh, uh, error. Um, and that is also basically at, at machine precision. Now, uh, if we try to do couple this with, we also try to couple this with the porous momentum equations, uh, uh, basically copying what's been done by Bjarne Jensen and co-workers in their coastal engineering paper from 2014. Uh, it's basically a matter of um, including darcy Fockheimer forces and the added mass force associated with acceleration of the, of the uh, fluid relative to the to the solid skeleton. Um, and, and so uh, one of the benchmark cases uh, here is, the, is this porous dam break where we start a, a column of, uh, or initialize a column of water here on the left hand side of this gray uh, porous zone. And then it collapses and we follow how the, um, how the interface evolves and seeps, how the fluid seeps through the, um, the porous zone. And what we show here are the experimental um, values um, in black circles, and then the corresponding um, curves from uh, from porous wave foam, basically what's in in waves to foam, um, and then also the new porous inter isofoam solver, and they match um, almost perfectly. Uh, it looks very nice. Uh, and then we have uh, volume fraction error again down to 10 to the minus uh, uh, 11 of uh, relative error as a function of, of time here. And again, we have a very good upper and lower bounding of the volume fraction field. And this is done together with my PhD student, Konstantinos Mischus and with Nils Jakobsen from Deltars. Um, yeah, and the code is available here. Okay, so that was Poros, uh, Poros, uh, support for porous media. Another very interesting uh, new development is uh, the work by Henning Scheufler, who has developed this two-phase flow library um, that I will now talk a little bit about. One of the main features of it is that we now have a compressible interflow solver. That's basically, it could also have been called compressible inter-isofoam. Um, so it basically takes the original, original WOF equation, the passive advection equation for alpha here, and then extends it by adding um, source terms uh, associated with the compressibility of, of the fluid. And, uh, and it also adds the relevant source terms for the, for the energy equation. 
Um, and yeah, uh, here we see sort of the yeah the depth charge to the tutorial uh, now using isoid vector instead of instead of mules. And uh, and this work is uh, published uh, in a preprint and on archive, which you can find here. And the code is also on on GitHub uh, publicly available. Uh, another interesting feature of this two-phase flow library is that it incorporates a new uh, phase change module. So phase change basically at the interface between the gas and the liquid uh, phases. Um, there's a whole module with, with various uh, uh, ways of in implementing mass source terms and energy source terms. Um, and there's also a whole um, um, bunch of different uh, benchmark cases implemented. For instance, this 1D Stefan problem where we have a, a superheated wall uh, and gas and then a liquid and then uh, um, energy is transferred from the uh, superheated wall to through the gas to the liquid where we have evaporation and then the interface here moves uh, as a function of time x of t here. And then we have very nice um, correspondence between the analytical result uh, solution for this uh, motion of the interface and the different implemented um, um, source term models here. Um, finally, I wanna mention that the library also has uh, a new module for implementing new surface force models. In particular, I wanna highlight here the, the curvature um, models where uh, Henning has implemented various different uh, curvature uh, calculation models. So basically um, trying to estimate the uh, curvature of, uh, of the interface from the volume fraction field. This is very difficult. And, and uh, what I show here on the right is, uh, yeah, the recalculated, uh, reconstructed curvature of a, just a circle on, on, on a hex mesh and a, a triangular prism mesh um, and the error in curvature as a function of resolution. And basically uh, these, uh, these uh, simulations, they don't, um, they don't uh, converge except for the height function method. So there's uh, basically room for, for improvement here. So just to sum up, we have a new porosity inter uh, isofoam solver. We have a two-phase flow library um, with a compressible interflow solver, phase change models, and surface tension models. Um, looking ahead, where some of the things we're focusing on, focusing on in, in my group is to increase the time step size and the accuracy for large time steps for isoid vector and also improve the fundamental interface kinematics uh, as well as surface tension and curvature calculations. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Great, thanks very much, uh, Johan, for uh, as always very nice work. We have uh, a few questions. <clears throat> um, Henrik asks, are there any known grid constraints on the inter isofoam solvers? Meaning do the cells at the interface need to be uniform size or similar constraint? Um, well, the answer to that is no. Um, so by construction, the um, the way in uh, isoid vector advects the interface um, requires the only requires the cell the faces to be polygonal. Um, it can probably behave bad if you have very non-planar um, uh, polygonal faces, but in general, it, the the method should work for general uh, arbitrary unstructured meshes. As with any simulations, if you if you if you throw a crab, a crab mesh at this, it will behave worse than if you have a nice mesh. But but it basically, it works for any mesh. Great, thanks. Uh, Ulf uh, says hi. Thanks for a very nice talk. Could you explain the main difference or differences between ISO add vector and the new surface interpolation interface capturing schemes PLIC and OpenFOAM V8? Uh, yes. So. Um, Basically, um, as I mentioned, the, um, the geometric WAF consists of two things. It consists of an interface reconstruction step and an interface advection step where we flux the water through the faces and thereby update the alpha field. Um, in, as I understand the, the foundation, the novel the geometric work in the foundation, they have impl implemented the geometric reconstruction step. So they basically reconstruct the interface, use that to get an estimate of the um, 
alpha field on the phases, um, which is then used to flux um, flux water through the phases, but they don't evolve that uh, alpha during a time step as as isoid vector does. Therefore, they don't get the same uh, shape preservation as as I have shown here in the beginning of this um, of this presentation. Okay, great. Um, Leonardo asks, does it have any disadvantage or flux restriction? I saw max alpha reached high values in the graph you presented. Um, max alpha um, did not reach high values. That was the error in, so basically the, the it's, yeah, alpha has to be between zero and one, and it is, uh, well, down to machine precision, more or less, uh, in the, um, in the graphs I've shown. It had, the main uh, disadvantage of isoid vector is that it's explicit in nature. That means that um, basically um, you have to use time step corresponding to a uh, current number less than or equal to zero. And the larger you use, the larger time step you use, the, the worse it performs. That's one of the things we are currently working on where there are some uh, interesting, you could say, low-hanging numerical fruits we are we are currently uh, investigating so i i suspect it will work with uh, larger time steps in the future um but but yeah that's that's work in progress great thanks very much uh, johan there's uh, one more yeah. question uh, but I'll, I'll let you answer it in in the chat afterwards okay yeah so, great so thanks. thanks very much for a nice talk and Thank i'll you. ask our second speaker uh, fedor um you can turn on your your camera and you can start sharing your screen Yep. Hi, one second. All right. All right, can everyone see the this presentation? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so my my presentation is about the liquid metal battery. And first I'm just going to talk about some motivation behind it. The liquid metal battery is poised to compete with grid level uh, electricity storage systems such as the lithium ion battery and pumped hydroelectric storage. And these, these technologies are sort of motivated by the growth in renewable energy over the next 20 years. And um, in particular, the liquid metal battery is better, well, could be better than those two um, highlighted. First, from the point of, view, point of view of durability, because the lithium ion battery suffers a lot from degradation from cycle and discharge cycles and cost um, because the both the lithium ion battery should be more expensive than the LMB and the pumped hydroelectric storage system uh, tends to be more expensive, both from the point of view of initial construction, the need of having a, like a big hill, for example, and the point of view of maintenance. Now for an introduction into the liquid metal battery itself, it's, it kind of works in a similar way to a traditional battery system, except for the fact that all the components are molten during the charge and discharge cycle. Um, basic operation is these molten layers segregate according to density variation um, and operate at a high temperature of 500 degrees C, for example. Um, I'm looking at uh, a design uh, which has been recently sort of uh, looked at by a lot of researchers and academics um, where one of the electrodes is enclosed into a metal foam um, so in this case, the lithium is enclosed in the, met in the metal foam and the bismuth uh, electrode is liquid um, on the floor. And in this kind of design, we, we can see that the key issue arises from the electrolyte layer. In order to compete with um, lithium ion and pumped hydroelectric storage for efficiency, for round trip efficiency, which is defined as energy in divided by energy out, um, the electrolyte layer needs to be made as thin as possible because that is where most of the energy loss is. Um, and from here on, we can kind of get a glimpse of the issue we might encounter is that we have two liquids um, segregated by density and there's an interface between the, between the electrolyte and the electrode. And if we sort of move the battery around potentially just, you know, because it's quite small, for example, if, we, if you just move it around and it starts sloshing, then if the two electrodes touch a lithium and bismuth, the battery might short circuit and that's potentially fatal. So that is sort of the key issue we're looking at. Um, now moving on, why, why might this sort of arise? Now, the challenge for them, for the batteries is scalability. Because of their small size, 
which is governed by certain stability criterions, um, they need to be clustered together into, into about 2,000 batteries per unit um, to reach uh, grid level uh, sort of capacity uh, scales. And inside these clusters, because of, we have currents flowing within each battery and we have uh, batteries being interconnected, uh, we see stray magnetic fields uh, arising inside the cluster. It's unclear exactly how, it's, how the cluster is connected, but a certain sort of back of the envelope uh, quick calculation can be done to show that the typical magnetic field strength expected is about, it's between one and five gauss. And this uh, magnetic field um, sort of has an effect on the liquid metal layer due to magnetohydrodynamics effect, dynamic effects, um, in particular due to the Lorentz body force. And we see this due to the interaction of the current density distribution um, into, with, with the magnetic field strength um, magnetic field um, that, that I described earlier, um, and this needs to be. Uh, this is what this project tries to understand. Um, and in particular, the things most uh, key are the non-dimensional groups, such as the Reynolds number, obviously, and also the Hartman number, which uh, compares the strength of the magnetic fields and the viscous forces inside the liquid metal liquid metal layer. Now, our model first of all, is rectangular. And that's different to a lot of the research being done at the moment. Um, and this was a conscious decision uh, because it's more similar to what the company Ambry is uh, is showing to be want to, to want to do on its website, for example, uh, which is to cluster these batteries together uh, with a rectangular geometry, which makes sense from a sort of geometric uh, point of view as well. And we needed to model the body force distribution which arises due to the Lorentz force. And um, the motivation behind this was to consider that the <clears throat> electrolyte layer is most susceptible to sort of horizontal forces. Therefore, the vertical magnetic field was most significant. And the interaction of the vertical field with the radially spreading current density produces um, a body force. And this is, is sort of modeled by this equation as, as seen in this, in this slide. And so this is a swirling type body force, and it's also motivated by the fact that the flow is mostly defined by the balance between total applied Lorentz torque and the total wall friction across the battery. And this is what the numerical solver uh, uh, was used for. Uh, so a numerical simulation was run using, using open foam um, to track this electrolyte, electrode electrolyte interface. Um, and by tracking the electrode electrolyte we could also get a glimpse at what was going on with the electrolyte thickness and we could also tell you know if the battery might short circuit for example um, and the battery was tested across uh, one to five gauss um, magnetic field strength applied and these are the results which were which were found uh, here's a movie of sort of a simple run of one gauss uh, so it's going to play it and what we can see is that the interface um, dips in the corners and maybe, maybe, maybe suggested that these dips arise due to these corner vortices. The arrows are, represent uh, velocity vectors. And so the corner vortices um, cause the dips. And you can also see that the interface sort of fluctuates, fluctuates a little bit. Um, now zooming into the interface, um, what was found is relatively large interface fluctuations um, in the section of the battery directly underneath, um, directly below the lithium electrode. And this was found for both one and five gauss uh, simulations. Now, for the five gauss case, um, some, some of the time frames, some of the extremes of these fluctuations were superposed on top of each other to kind of showcase uh, how big these fluctuations might be. And it was found that they could be up to 25% um, of the thickness of the electrode, electrolyte layer. Um, and this might lead to battery performance degradation. And the motivation behind this sort of, um, it, behind this was uh, taken from looking at the aluminium reduction um, cell industry and where it's typically considered that in a, in a reduction cell, um, if the electrolyte thickness changes by more than sort of 25, 30%, then significant problems may come and, and the performance of the cell may be significantly compromised. And from 
the, the study, sort of the main conclusion is there will be, there might be significant interface fluctuations seen for the sort of geometry that was looked at for the magnetic fields tested. And the question is, what what would this do to the battery performance? You know, if we if we were to have the battery be scalable, so clustered together, um, would we see a loss of chemistry perhaps because of these fluctuations? Would we see possible areas of short circuiting? And could this possibly lead to some sort of failure of the battery? Uh, and this leads to the sort of key next steps. And you know, we, we need to minimize the impact of the lecture like thickness fluctuation. Um, this could be done essentially by trying to reduce the stray field strength or maybe changing the geometry such that perhaps the corner vortices aren't as significant and doing further work and understanding how this behavior may, may change. Um, so yeah, the, these are the main conclusions and that's my talk. Thank you very much. And are there any questions? Great, thanks very much Feder, for a nice uh, talk. So if people have questions, they can type them in the chat. So we've uh, one question from Norbert. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for the very nice presentation. Did you solve for potential and current in the housing and feeding line too? And then he has a follow-on, two follow-on questions. Or did you replace them by simplified boundary conditions? I would, I, would, I would expect that the diverging current might lead to an electro vortex flow, which can completely suppress the sloshing instability. Um, yes, yeah, so first question. Cool. Um, no, I did. We did not solve for the current distribution. We modeled it by um, this, uh, and the motivation here is, and I guess that moves on to the electro vortex flow. I did. We did not look at the electro. Uh, oh, sorry. Your 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 mic is uh, has stopped working. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah. So we didn't solve for the potential for this, uh, difference. Field and also didn't, didn't solve for current density. We modeled this using this uh, distribution and electric, electro vortex flow wasn't looked at and um, it would be interesting to see uh, to, to, to solve um, sort of the flow in, with, with both, considering both, both effects. Um, but it was sort of, um, the, the, it, the problem was isolated for the stray magnetic field. Um, yeah, uh, so I don't know if that helps. Sure. Uh, which uh, solver is, is this that you're using, or is it a uh, custom? Interfoam. It's interfoam. So it's essentially it's interfoam where you just impose a, a body force given by by this formula, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Um. Yeah. Um. I have a couple of questions. One just on my understanding of the, these liquid metal batteries. So if they're segregated by gravity, does that mean if you flip one of these batteries over that you will short circuit it? Um. Well, okay, I, my assumption is yes. I'm not 100% of this, because okay. I, I've only done it for the last year, but my assumption is yes, that, that makes sense. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Um, and then in terms of validation, um, how is it possible to validate a simulation like, like this, or how, or how could you validate a simulation like this? Well, okay, so to begin with, we ran for this exact same geometry without the body force, we just did some sloshing, um, impose, imposed this sinusoidal um, wave and just fat, you know, calculated the frequency of the sloshing and compared it to theoretical values and that was fine. Uh, but that was very basic from the point of view of actually imposing the body force. Um, well, it was attempted to match the total, to actually match the, the total applied torque to the total wall friction, but, um, sort of that was un inconclusive because the total, the values we got for total wall friction were fluctuating so much, it was difficult to see whether the average of those values was actually matching the total applied Lorentz torque or not. So actually a characteristic velocity was taken, probed in certain locations and to see whether that converged to a steady value to consider whether the spin up time was reasonable and it was, but that's sort of as far as we went with the validation. So it would need more work in terms of validation. Great, and um, very good. So there, there are no more questions. So thanks very much for for a nice uh, talk. Heather. And just one comment from uh, from her uh, to Norbert that uh, you're happy to include electromagnetics in, in the future. And um, great. So um, we'll <coughs> move on to our third speaker. Uh, that's uh, Mr. Gary Littler from UCD. So Gary, feel free to uh, turn on your camera and share your screen. Full cheers.
share screen. Hi everyone, and uh, thanks for attending. Uh, I'm Gary, and I'm a master's student at UCD. Uh, my presentation is on developing seabed scour assessment and prediction tools using computational fluid dynamics modeling, or the demo project. And a little bit about the outline. Uh, I'll start off with a little bit about uh, renewable energy, uh, move on to scour, what is it and why does it matter, and a bit about the demo project itself. So our methods, uh, the study area chosen, the modeling plan and some possible advanced modeling. So I'm sure you've all heard of the Paris Agreement. Everybody's trying to meet uh, carbon neutral targets and a uh, big part of that is renewable energy. So around the UK and Ireland, we're uh, very, very suited and there's massive investment uh, to offshore renewables. And then this talk will be about specifically offshore wind power. Now, um, you can see on the right hand side there, there's a um, that's the Arklu uh, uh, wind farm, the only actual existing structure uh, in Ireland. Uh, that's a two-stage project, and stage one was completed about 2004, and uh, they're hoping to have the second stage up and producing electricity by 2025. So what is SCAR? Um, SCAR occurs when shear strips on the bend, as they see the, the frictional and rotational forces that are actually holding the grains in place, uh, governed by the shields uh, parameter, uh, dimensionless number there, as you can see on the right hand side. Uh, and if you leave it alone, something like this can happen. This is actually uh, shortly after the installation of a monopile at Arklo. So uh, if you leave that alone, uh, I'm sure you can imagine the catastrophe that could occur uh, with uh, destabilization of the structure or possible toppling. So companies have to invest, invest heavily in time and uh, money to actually fill it back in and then proceed to try and mitigate the, the issue with uh, defenses like rock armor, but that might not solve the problem. So it's useful to actually uh, have a prediction model in place, and that's where the demo project comes in. Uh, it's part of the Geological Survey of Ireland's uh, research program. Uh, that's where funding came from. And we're trying to ask, what is the range of scar development in the Irish Sea? Uh, what formation processes are involved in influencing parameters and our goals? are to use CFD to model the areas of excess shear stress around a pro proxy object uh, chosen. In our case, it's going to be a shipwreck. Uh, to validate the model, uh, comparing it to real world observations, uh, adapt the model to apply to monopile turbines and possibly other structures, and uh, to explore other possibilities to improve the robustness of the model or its, its accuracy or applications. Now, the data that we actually gathered is from a number of GSI and Marine Institute, Institute projects. So the scope project uh, involving ICRAG and GDG, uh, the GIST uh, survey led by ICRAG again, uh, and the morphodynamic study of the Irish Sea project uh, funded through the Marine Institute and involving again GDG and ICRAG. So bathymetry, what is it? Uh, basically, uh, bathymetry is... Uh, it's a, a picture of the, the seabed, so uh, taken from uh, uh, a measuring device on uh, board uh, a moving platform, so uh, either an acoustic echo sound or LIDAR. LIDAR is brilliant for shallow water, obviously being light-based, uh, uh, pretty useless for deep water, so uh, ours was all gathered from, from on board a ship. You saw the shoot two ships earlier of the Marine Institute, the Celtic Voyager and the uh, Celtic Explorer. Um, so uh, here's a lovely example actually showing exactly what uh, they do. They're going and taking transect after transect and zigzagging back and forth until they get a, 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 nowadays quite a high resolution representation of the seabed and what's on it. And you can actually view uh, a lot of this on the Infomore website. I would definitely suggest going and taking a look. Uh, shipwrecks, pipelines, uh, drop-offs of the shelf, it's, uh, it's, it's some really nice stuff. And there you can see the sort of level of detail you can expect in a 3D model uh, from the information, <coughs> excuse me, the information available. Uh, so what area did we choose? What wreck did we use? Uh, we had a, lot, a few different uh, wrecks to choose from, uh, but we based our criteria on uh, somewhere close to where a monopile might actually be installed. Uh, so the company standards uh, and availability of data, obviously, we needed to have repeat surveys in the case of the one that we chose, it's the SS Powell. We have uh, three years full of uh, data for the 
likes of the current me vector magnitude and such. Uh, we wanted it to be clear of uh, marine protected areas uh, and shipping lanes. So uh, you can see here, it's that's Dublin there. So it's north to east of here. So it's not directly outside the mouth. Uh, it needed to be in a reasonable substrate. So uh, you're not going to go and try and put this in rock. Uh, just not, not viable at all. And it needed to be less than the cutoff depth for a monopile turbine of around 50 meters. Uh, beyond that, you've got to use a floating platform. So, uh, and it's actually, it's close to proposed installations. Uh, you can just sort of see at the top of here, that's the top of Arco Bank to give you a reference over where, that, where that's actually at. And this, uh, I think, is a very nice representation to show you the, the direction you can imagine of the current uh, paired with a, a rose diagram here, uh, and that's current frequency. So our initial, initial modeling plan, that'll be a RANS simulation based on a paper by Quinn and Smith. Uh, we're using uh, an idealized surface for the seabed, so uh, a roughness will be applied to that. Uh, it's, it's a simplified approach, and we just find where the high areas of shear stress are actually at. So we've got the inlet, and that outlet will be patch type, slip condition on the top wall down the bottom, and symmetry either side. So uh, the solver to use is pimple foam, because uh, it's a large step transient solver, obviously, for compressible flow, and can solve for turbulent flows, and we'll be using uh, the K-Epsilon uh, turbulence model. The uh, initial velocity will be 0.147, meters per second based on an average uh, of the three years uh, current velocities. So, and water will be represented at 10 degrees uh, based on uh, our uh, assigning a kinematic, kinematic uh, viscosity of 1.307 uh, based on the previous paper I mentioned. So that's, uh, that's the actual resolution we've got of the Powell there. That's 20 centimeters resolution. So you can see there's actually quite a high level of detail we're, we're working with here. So. Uh, it's, it's, it's a joy to work with, to be honest. <laughs> uh, that's the initial bound, boundary area we've got at the moment. Uh, so 100 meters by 100 meters and 25 meters up. The Powell is actually 29 meters uh, deep, but uh, as the sea surface is a, a dynamic and changing area due to waves and currents and that, it's, it's useful, I think, to have a, a buffer in between. So to verify our model, we'll run a mesh sensitivity study. Uh, uh, and we'll be testing also uh, different domain sizes to ensure there's no boundary effects and obviously making it the smallest possible without any adverse effects. Uh, validating, we're going to, like I said earlier, we're going to uh, compare it to real world data, the repeat surveys, and then switch the, the, the rec out uh, and the seabed for one or the other was a possibility and see if it can stand up to that change. Once that's been uh, verified and validated, uh, we can then uh, model a monopile turbine, or we could extend that if we want beyond that uh, rock armor cables, pipelines, a monkey's head, whatever, whatever you want to throw down there, to be awfully honest. And uh, advanced modeling. Now, we haven't had a, a large discussion about this yet, but um, instead of using an ide idealized surface, using a sediment transport model to more accurately uh, measure the volume sediment moved based on, obviously, the grain size and uh, Etc. I think would uh, really, really improve the the model, provided everything obviously goes all right. This is still uh, early stages. We're about six months through, so <laughs> uh, hopefully that's where we'll be moving in the end. And that is the end of my talk. Thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions or suggestions, uh, absolutely. Great. Thanks very much, Gary. Uh, very interesting uh, talk. If people have questions, feel free to type them into the chat. Yeah, I have a few uh, a few uh, questions looking at it. Well, first of all, some comments. The um, it looks like the the data set is is really really nice, really rich data set. How much? At what format do, does this uh, experimental data come in? It comes in uh, well, it can come in a variety, but you uh, usually bring it down to like a shape file. But the uh, the actual uh, ship itself and the geometry was a point cloud uh, okay. format. And how do you, so you, I, do you use snappy hex mesh then to mesh your domain around the... Yeah, 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 sorry, yeah, I'm using snappy hex mesh to get that to take out. How do you go from your point point cloud to a, an SDL? So uh, the, the point cloud, uh, I went through Blender, actually. Uh, big right. shout out to Yosef Naj. <laughs> uh, very good. 
Very nice. And how, how large are these uh, meshes? You mentioned about mesh sensitivity, and I, I know this is a project that's, that's still ongoing, uh, but are you ending up with very large amounts of cells? Uh, you know, I've uh, not been that far with it, but um, I think the last measurement of a cell when I was just starting to increase size was about 18 million. So, okay. yeah. If you're going to take some time to run these, so you, yeah, you'll need a, a deep, uh, you'll probably need to use a, one of the clusters available to you or something like that. Oh, yeah, definitely. The HPC cluster is going to be a large <laughs> part of this. <laughs> Can I ask you a little bit down about the sediment transport? So, you've identified this sediment transport approaches, uh, maybe the the one that will be most suitable. Uh, has that been implemented in OpenFoam? Uh, do you know? Uh, no, I don't know that yet. Um, I would definitely like to to actually look into that uh, further at the moment. I've just sort of taken everything step by step. Sure. I'm, I'm like, I have no real history in fluid dynamics or anything. So it's all a learning experience. Okay, okay, perfect. Um, that's the, that's great then. I, I don't have any more questions. So thanks very much for a nice, a nice talk, uh, Gary. Cheers. Fantastic. And uh, that brings us to the final talk for this session. So that's Mr. Jansi Zeng so, um, from Chaotong in Shanghai. So Jansi um, is not able to present live due to some internet challenges, but he has sent on a pre-recording. Um, so I'm not sure if he's available to answer questions. I don't see him in the panelists at the moment. Hopefully he'll turn up to answer questions. Um, uh, if not, we'll just bring the session to a close after uh, after the, the talk. So I think the video is going to be the recording is going to be played now. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jian Chai Zheng, come from Shanghai Jiao Tong University. I would like to share my presentation with you in the next time. The title of my topic is. Uh, Study on the coupled error elastic performance of wind turbines considering blade deformation. The contents of my report include the five parts. First is about the motivation of the plant work. As we all know, the wind turbine is developing towards the direction of light weight. This factor makes the wind turbine blind slender, lighter, and therefore more flexible. Meanwhile, wind farm, which have a large capacity to contain plenty of wind turbines, are becoming the main electric energy source. Therefore, coupled aeroelectric performance with considering blade deformation for wind farms must be careful considered. In the present work, we propose a coupled aeroelectric analysis model EALM based on the ALM and the Ola Bernoulli beam theory. Coupled aeroelectric performance is simulated by using the elastic actor line model and the large eddy simulation method. The aerodynamic performance blade tip dis displacement weak characteristic weak vertex structure are uh, analyzed in detail. The next part is about the numerical method. As shown in figure, the aerodynamic loads and the blade deformation are predicted by EALM. In the EALM model, the coupling of structure deformation and the aerodynamic performance are achieved by exchanging the data between different calculation models. The slide demonstrates what actor line model. First, each blade was divided into a series of actor points, and then the aerodynamic force can be got according to two-dimensional at foil profile data. 
Here we list two kind of model. The first is standard ALM model, and another is the EALM model, which consider the blade deformation. After that, the falls on each point are then smoothed to the cell using the, the special smooth technology. The result of this body force on the cell are treated as a short term when solving the NS equations. This is the standard ALM method, and the lift and drag force can be calculated as this formula using the coefficients at each exit point from the experimental date. Then the body force can be expressed as a as a, as a formula. The slide shows how to smooth the calculated force on each calculator point. A canal function like this formula is adopted to stand to stand for how much influence of actuator point is on the surrounding, surrounding cells. The parameter d is the distance between cell center and the actuator point, and the epsilon is the control projection values. And the suggestion of the parameter epsilon can be in two ways. The figure demonstrates how the actuator influences the surrounding cells. The smallest body force, then, is added to the moment equation like this. The slide shows the EARM. When considering the blade deformation, the blade is equivalent to the two-dimensional beam element, the like the left figure, the relative when the velocity at the blade section is like the right figure, and uh, the left and drag force are then calculated using the same procedure but uh, with different relative velocity, where the deformation had been taken into account. Structure governing equations are derived based on the Ola Bernoulli beam theory. A finite element mo node model with two nodes, full degree of freedom, is employed to calculate the dynamic structure response of wind beam blades. The method spring damping equations are adopted as the structure governing equations, as shown in the following equations. The total solving is shown in the flow chart. At the beginning, the structure model and the flow model are initialized. In each time step calculation, structure diving equation are solved according to the velocity and force calculator in the previous time step. Then, the position and the inflow condition of the blade are updated based on the structure deformation at the current time step. Next, the ARM predicts the aerodynamic force and put the body force generated by the aerofoil segment into a flow field. The peso awesome is employed to couple the pressure and the velocity in flow governing equations. The flow state includes the pressure and the velocity in flow field are updated after the end of a peso awesome. Then jump to the next time step. Next, we will introduce the the setup of the numerical cases. In this work, the NIER Wu Zhao Wa 
when the tabing is adopted, all numerical example in this paper adopt the same computing domain. The picture on the below shows the gender distribution. The total cell number is 4.2 million. In case 1, the ARM is adopted. In case 2, the EARM is adopted, in which the deformation of the blade is taken into consideration. The boundary conditions are listed in the table on the right. The next part is about the readouts and the discussion. The animation shows the coupled response of two unit beings in coupled case. In case two, the influence of electric blade on the unit beings are taken into consideration. By, con by contrast, the case one and the case two, it can be seen that when the downstream turbine is distributed by the upstream turbine, the weak vertex structure is delayed to appear. The detailed analysis will be described below. This picture shows the rotate power of upstream and downstream wind turbines. It can be seen that rotate power of wind turbine 1 um, reduces obviously while the rotate power of wind turbine 2 fluctuates slightly when the deformation of the blade is considered. As shown in the table, the rotate power of wind turbine in case 2 is slightly small, smaller than case 1, um, which indicates that the deformation may have bad effect on the aerodynamic loads of the wind pain. For the trust, it can be seen from this picture the trend of aerodynamic trust is similar to the aerodynamic power, moreover, the reduced amplitude of rotated power in K2 is greater than trust in K2. It suggests that the influence of deformation on rotated power is more significant than, the, than on the trust. This figure shows the deformation of blade 1. We can see that the distance of information in x direction is 5.1 meter and the distance of deformation in y direction is less than x direction. The velocity distribution in the horizontal plane at the reference height 90 meters shown in, the in this figure from the counter of weak flow field. Average velocity decreases sharply behind the rotor plane in both cases. However, it's worth to be noted that the wind velocity decreases more obviously when the wind passes through the upstream wind turbine in K2. It suggests that the deformation of blade mainly influences the far field. This is the animation of vorticity in yin long, longitudinal y plane. We can find that the disturbance of a tip of vertex occurs in the far weak region in K2, and the disordered phenomenon of a weak vertex or a downstream wind turbine is delayed because of the deformation in K2. The last part is about the conclusions and the ongoing work. We can get the following conclusions. The first is uh, the structure deformation of one of the blades lead to a decrease in average aerodynamic loads, and the blood and the blade deformation has great effect on the load power than the trust. Through the influ influencing the aerodynamic performance, 
the blade deformation for outer tabing weak characteristics. The change in weak velocity and the rotation mainly occur the far weak. In the near future, we will carry out the following two aspects of research. The first is the influence of different layout on carbon aerodynamic electric of the wind turbine in wind farm. The influence of blade deformation on carbon aerodynamics electric of FOWT. Thank you for listening. There are all the contents of my report. Okay, <clears throat> that final uh, talk, in case you missed it, was a pre-recording from Mr. GMC Zheng from Zhao Tong University in Shanghai. Uh, so I don't see uh, Jiangxi on the list of participants, so um, he hasn't joined. So unfortunately, uh, we won't be able to answer questions. So I will thank the four speakers again, and I'll bring this session uh, to a close. So uh, we're coming to the end of the workshop now. Um, so look out for the, the splash uh, talks, um, and then we'll have one more technical session before the, the closing. Thanks very much, everyone.